going to begin uh, by reading a poem that I was given when I, about 40 years ago, so I'll let you figure out how old I was. But anyway, it goes this way. I do not choose to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dulled by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to barter incentive for a dole. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the stale calm of utopia. I will not trade freedom for beneficence or my dignity for a handout. I will never cower before any master, nor bend to any threat. It is my heritage to stand erect, proud, and unafraid, to think and act for myself, enjoy the benefits of my creations, and to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. All this is what it means to be an American. Now, I will say something about that last line at the very end of my talk. But now what I want to do on this occasion is talk about eight basic tenets of Rand's thought. And I'm going to go in her way from political philosophy down to almost to metaphysics and give you some kind of general idea of why this novelist is certainly one of the most interesting thinkers of the last century and someone that needs to be paid close attention to. The first and foremost tenet of her thought is, number one, that the purpose of government is the protection of individual rights. Rights here are understood as claim rights. That is to say, if I have a right, then others have an obligation. These rights are understood as negative, meaning that people should not interfere in three fundamental rights. The right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to property. The right to life means the right to live your life according to your own choices, not according to the choices of someone else. The right to liberty means the right to make your own decisions and to act on those decisions and not be compelled or coerced to do something that you have not consented to. And finally, the right to property is the right to keep and use, as you see fit, the resources that you have created. For Rand, the aim of the political legal order is to protect these rights and to use a phrase that we find in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, when governments no longer protect these rights, the legitimacy of that government is questionable, to put it mildly. Rights are for Rand the link between the, a code of an individual and the legal code of a society. A right for her is something like the rules of the game, how we are to get along in a civilized manner. A right doesn't tell you how to live your life, it doesn't tell you how to play the game well, but rights are the minimal conditions for civilized society, according to Rand. So the purpose of government is to protect individual rights. The second tenet of her thought is that capitalism is a, not amoral, nor is it immoral. It's a system based on individual rights. Capitalism has to be understood in a normative manner. Murder incorporated, no matter how profitable it might be, is not a legitimate firm. A person going up to you on the street with a knife and says, your money or your life, and you go, okay, here's my money. That's not a free exchange. And if somebody sells you an automobile, as we normally understood the, understand an automobile, and they just decide to exclude an engine from the automobile, okay, that's not a legitimate exchange either. That's a matter of fraud. So there are certain moral principles, 
In fact, these principles are based on individual rights that undergird and explain how a capitalist economic system operates. It's implicit in our very understanding of how capitalism works. To put it another way, in, a, in language that we're probably very familiar now uh, in the last two or three years, especially in the United States, capitalism, as Rand conceives it, is not crony capitalism. It's not, as Smith would call it, mercantilism. It's not where the government decides who's going to win and who's going to lose. It's a free market. Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug, that novel, illustrates the effects of crony capitalism, the effects of it on a society, on a culture, and on people. In fact, she quotes quite vividly that, uh, that such a system inevitably moves more and more towards a system that looks like fascism, at least economic fascism. Capitalism, properly understood, unleashes the, the, the greatest potentials we have for wealth, the greatest potential we have uh, for happiness, and that potential is found in the exercise of our ultimate resource, which for Rand is the human mind. The third tenet of her thought is that individual human beings are ends in themselves, not means to the ends of others. Now John Locke put it this way in his second treatise. He said, there are no natural moral slaves or natural moral sovereigns. No one has, by nature, a slavery position or, by nature, a rulership position. That is not a starting point for civilized life. Now, to say that hum human beings are also ends in themselves is also for Rand to emphasize a thoroughly humanistic perspective. There is no need for a transcendent order, otherworldly or otherwise, to make one, uh, make one an end in him or herself. Furthermore, this idea that we are ends in themselves is thoroughly individualistic. One does not need to serve others, society, the so-called common good or whatever, in order to find dignity and worth. You have that because you are a human being. The only real question you have is whether you'll take the actions necessary to fulfill yourself. Which brings me to the fourth tenet of Rand's thought. The aim of each person's life is to flourish as a human being. Now Rand used, if you notice, Rand wrote a book, maybe you're familiar with it, it's called The Virtue of Selfishness. Colon, a new concept of egoism. So for her, when she used the word self-interest, she did not mean the self-interest of Thomas Hobbes, she did not mean just uh, the analysis we get from homo economicus, economic man, but rather she viewed a human being as a moral agent, homo moralis. And so the aim of life for her is for us to find in our own unique ways our fulfillment, our well-being, as I said, human flourishing. This is very close to old Aristotle's idea of the life of eudaimonia, which is usually translated from the Greek as happiness, but we, usually we use the word flourishing today. But anyway, Rand sees human flourishing as a life that involves virtues, like integrity, rationality, productivity. She has a full discussion of this. Now, the interesting thing about Rand is that she would say, you may have the right to live your life any way you want, consistent with respecting the rights of others, okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean that the way of life that you chose is right for you. So she's not a subjectivist. She actually thinks there are moral values, there are moral truths, but these moral truths have an individual meaning. In other words, the key thing in life is figuring out how am I, as the individual human being I am, to put a worthwhile life together. I happen to think this is more difficult than anything physicists have ever thought about or can think about, but that's another issue. So she has a view of morality that says that the nature of a human being, both in terms of what and who we are, is the standard. Now, just to say a side comment here, if you've ever heard the word natural law, 
natural law is not a religious notion. The word law fundamentally is not command, not convention, but standard or measure. Anything that is a standard or a measure is what, what the meaning of law is. You know, a cubit's a measure. Remember? The nature of a human being is the law. That's the standard. That's why we ultimately say that certain societies, certain cultures, when they really go out of whack, we say there's no way that can be right. But anyway, going on. The fifth point of Rand is that human beings are beings that can reason and choose. And this is a, she's beginning to get deep into human nature here. And she wants to say that human beings are beings with the power to entertain the world in conceptual terms, to reflect about who and what we are, to try to understand things beyond the perceptual level, to think beyond space and time, to think outside of history, to think about grand theoretical questions and to figure out where the hell am I going to get a good supper tonight to understand that reason works both at the universal and at the particular. This type of awareness, which is generally called conceptual awareness, is for Rand not something that occurs automatically. It requires effort. It requires self-direction. It requires, in old-fashioned terms, hard work. I always like to ask my students after, after a two-and-a-half-hour essay exam where you have they got the blue books in front of them and all they're doing is moving their hand like this. I said, hey, how do you feel? Was that effort? Was that work? And they go, uh, of course it was. Thinking requires effort. We are self-directed beings. We have to, in effect, turn on our intellectual lights. Another way of describing Rand's ethics is to say it's an ethics of self-perfection. And if so, what Rand would say is that we are both the agent and the object of that self-perfection. And finally, when Rand talks about human flourishing, she, there's no idea, and I say this to our conservative friends, there's no such thing as coercing us to be moral or coercing us to, be flour, to flourish. Rand is famous for this statement, quote, to try to force a man to be good is like trying to provide a man a picture gallery at the price of cutting out his eyes. Great insights here, huh? Anyway, these are some of the things that are involved in our understanding of human flourishing. Now to get a little epistemological and metaphysical on us for a minute. Um, Rand believes that the human mind can know reality. She doesn't think that we are gods. She knows we are limited. She knows we are fallible. We know that we start somewhere and we build up. But she's quite confident that human beings can have knowledge of reality. It may be three steps forward, two steps back, but we can do this. Rand indeed understood the history of most modern philosophy from Descartes on as an attack on the cognitive efficacy of the human mind. So she's really radical about how she thinks what philosophy has done. I could talk about that a lot, but I won't. Seventh point, reality is intelligible. For her, to be is to be something. Reality is not a result of our classifications. The reason we say there goes a brown bear and we don't say there goes a bearish brown brown bear, bearish brown, is because that's fundamentally the way the world is, not merely because how we divide it up. That's obviously a controversial point, but I think it's important. For her, and if you'll notice that the parts of Atlas Shrugged are div divided into three areas, that of the, uh, the principle of non-contradiction, the principle of excluded middle, and the law of identity, those are great, what well, they call those the classic laws of thought. But those laws of thought for Rand are also descriptions of the fundamental character of reality. The whole point being here is to say that the world is intelligible. And this get, brings me now to the eighth thesis, Prometheus Unbound. Though nothing is guaranteed, since reality is intelligible, 
since we can know the world, since we do have a function and a purpose, and that's to flourish. And if we are free, there is nothing that in principle prevents any of us from happiness and fulfillment. The world not only is not a veil of tears, it is a place for human achievement, well-being, and happiness. And there are more potentialities there than we have even begun to consider. The interesting thing about Rand in Atlas Shrugged is not only is it an indictment of a system that limits human freedom and thus limits, limits the ultimate resource of the human mind, but it's also an idea that there's so much to life. There's so much to be achieved if we will but, but allow ourselves to be free and to use that ultimate resource, which is the human mind. I like to say that the first entrepreneur in the history of the world, at least if you take the Bible, was this woman, with the help of a snake, who looked at the apple and goes, hmm, that might be good to eat. It's the first entrepreneurial act. <laughs> Think about that. Knowledge is the ultimate capital good. Knowledge is the ultimate capital good. And without the exercise of the human mind, we're not going to have that. And the human mind doesn't function too well with a gun pointed at its head. Now, that's graphic terms. I could get much more philosophical and much more technical on you and all that kind of stuff but I don't think this is the occasion for that. But I mean, this is the message that I read a long time ago. It was given to me <laughs> uh, by a, a parish assistant <laughs> in Our Savior's Lutheran Church. But anyway, what can I say? People give you books and you read them and that starts things. Which, by the way, reminds me of being given things. Remember that poem I read? Right? And remember the last line? All this is what it is to be an American. Remember that? I got that poem, as I said, about 40 years ago. I got it from a guy that was working at my grandfather's motel in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And that's in the middle of the United States. That's where I grew up. And the guy's name was Steve. And he's a hard worker, and he was going to make money like crazy. And he gave me the poem on a little card, which I still have. And Steve had come from this country called Lithuania. And he had seen socialism. He had seen things. And, you know, I'm just a kid sort of talking about politics. He says, read that. So, he, so a guy from Lithuania helped me understand my own heritage, which now goes back to the poem. Let me also quote now one of my favorite founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. There's all sorts of reasons I like Benjamin Franklin, some of which I cannot publicly say. But anyway... One of the things about Franklin is he spent lots of his t life away from the North American continent. Lots of his adult life. And his favorite saying was, where liberty dwells, where liberty dwells, there is my country. Thank you.